So today we have Ms. Kanisha Ringgold, uh, Deputy Counsel for the University. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, can you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and your background? Sure. I'm um, right now. I am the uh, general deputy general counsel for the university. Um, I started my career here in Delaware. I took the Delaware bar, New Jersey bar, and Pennsylvania bars, but I've settled in Delaware. Um, in the beginning of my career, I was in private practice doing a lot of um, corporate civil defense litigation. And then I found myself in public service, which I have really, really enjoyed. I worked at the Department of Justice under um, Bo Biden during his tenure, and then um, during Matt Den's tenure, if you're familiar with Delaware politics. And I left um, in sort of the beginning of um, uh, Kathleen Jennings' tenure. So, um, and then jumping over to a public university, sort of the things uh, that drew me towards the law are the same things that kind of drew me to education, higher education. Well, great. Thank you so much. Um, so, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Dobbs decision. Um, can you tell us what happened and what the ruling they made was? Sure. To, to sort of understand what happened, we're going to go back to 1973. We'll talk about Roe v. Wade. And, you know, everyone knows that Roe found the right to um, bodily autonomy, which was under the rights of personal liberty. And that was expressed for any students who are watching under the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. Um, and that was the law of the land. That's what everyone proceeded with. We have a constitutional right under this sort of penumbra of rights. Um, and then those rights were more defined in Planned uh, Parenthood versus Casey, which is one of those, um, when I went to law school, we always read Roe, we read um, Casey, and those were, you know, how we created our thought process around privacy rights and, and the right to an abortion. Um, and it's sort of like framed how we thought about our privacy rights, because prior to Roe, we didn't have those rights. Um, and then we can sort of understand how we got here by looking at the Obama administration. Um, many of the younger people who may be watching this now, they, they were formed by the Obama administration. Um, and they may remember that after Antonin Scalia passed away, um, there was this rush to try to, you know, appoint another uh, justice. Fortunately, well, not fortunately, but factually, Obama was able to uh, appoint two justices to the court. Um, but during his last term, um, when it was time for him to appoint another, he was going to appoint Merrick Garland. And Merrick Garland is currently uh, serving under the Biden administration um, as our attorney general. Um, but but that that the fact that he was not able to appoint an additional justice to the court really turned the balance once the Trump administration um, came in. And so Trump, um, that's not unprecedented, but it's very rare that a single president in a single term will be able to appoint three justices. So he was able to appoint Neil, Gers Neil Gersuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. So the law and at issue in this case is the Mississippi's Gestational Age Act, which basically has this, the, the the, the central provision is that in, in, except in an emergency, a medical emergency or a case of a severe fetal abnormality, um, a person shall not intentionally or knowingly perform or induce an abortion of an unborn human if the probable gestational age of the unborn human was determined to be greater than 15 weeks. So that was um, the, the challenge in, in under the Supreme Court. And they were asking the court um, to ban all elective abortions after 15 weeks and to decide whether that was constitutional. Um, and Dobbs argues that the court should overturn the precedent and return these constitutional rights to the states to determine, you know, the measures of pre-viability for abortion. So um, the, the Roe and Casey gave us sort of this framework um, with about 24 weeks of fetal viability. In 1973, obviously, um, technology and the medicine has come a long way uh, with regard to um, how long a fetus can uh, uh how viable a fetus is outside of a woman's body. And so um, people who were, you know, pro-life um, wanted to see how they could push that. Um, times have changed. We have a conservative course, a, a conservative court now. Um, and obviously you can see uh, these rights that we've taken for, for granted um, all of this time um, were, were, were basically overruled. So that's what happened in, in the Supreme Court case. So one of the things that I've had a hard time wrapping my head around is the the basis of the court's reasoning behind the Dobbs decision. Can you explain that to us? 
Well, the reasoning of it, well, we're, we're going to talk about liberty a little bit here. So we all we, people hear about, you know, our liberty rights and the right to liberty um, and also privacy rights. So this, this this case was there's discussion about what privacy means and what right to privacy do we have? And if you ask your your um, average American, you would think they have some rights to privacy. We understand rights to privacy in a context of like being searched, kind of like we have a right to a privacy in our homes. We don't have a right to privacy to our trash on the curb. We don't have a right to that. Um, and so the court being very conservative has returned to this sort of interpretation of the constitution of what did these people think about privacy at the time? What were their thoughts about it? Because that's where they're trying to draw what our constitutional rights are. Um, now, some there, there are some schools of thought that we should not be looking to the intent of our constitutional uh, uh, authors or the, the, the laws at the time that we should be interpreting them in a modern context. So you have these different schools of thought. If we had different judges on the Supreme Court, perhaps they wouldn't look to what these people thought um, at, at the dawn of our uh, country and how to interpret our rights. So basically you have the um, Justice Alito who was authoring the, the opinion basically says that um, there are protections and freedoms that are not explicitly named in the constitution and they have to be limited to those rights that were understood amongst most people in our country's history. So uh, the legal reasoning that Justice Alito was saying is that we haven't had hundreds of years of protection uh, of a woman's right to an abortion um, in our law. So he's saying, you know, we, we're not going to be creating these new rights. We're going to uh, let states determine what rights under this, uh, under privacy exist and not interpret them, interpret them to be constitutional rights. In your in your opinion and in your your knowledge, um, do you think the court's legal reasoning holds up? So when you go to law school, your professor will always <laughs> will say to you, maybe you know there's a, there's two different ways. We, the reason why being an attorney is so fascinating because there's there's hardly ever one reason. The reason why cases go to trials because we have laws and people are interpreting them, and um, depending on how you're interpreting the law. Um, it can go either way. If cases were slam dunks all the time, most of the time you probably wouldn't go to court. You probably would settle it. You would know that you lost or you know you don't have any rights. Um, but because our law gives us wiggle room to argue to make different arguments, um, the legal reasoning can be justified on both sides, right? So a conservative would say, I believe that we should be interpreting what our rights are based on the historical context. And a modern, a person who's going to seek to have a more um, modern approach is going to say, you know what? Um, we have these right, we have a established uh, desari, uh, states, uh, stare decisis and also legal precedent. And we have these things because when the Supreme Court makes a, you know, makes a determination of what our rights are, um, people who would say we should really stick to stare decisis and precedent because it gives the constituents and our country this comfort of knowing these are our rights, these are the law. We're not going to be going back and forth and changing it with every administration. And um, growing up, I had this view of the Supreme Court as very apolitical, you know, calling the balls and strikes, not inserting their personal philosophies or beliefs into things. Um, and now we can see that we do have a court who some would call an activist court, you know, that there are things that they would like to overturn. And now that they have the power to do so are going to do it. So it really just depends on who you are. If you're asking me to be um, um, it, what my opinion is, I, I believe that the, the legal reasoning doesn't hold up when we look in terms of, of, of what the country would want right now, what the country perceives um, liberty to be and privacy to be, and it's not what it was back then. And so if we're trying to be a progressive nation, um, I'm not in the camp of interpreting the Constitution in terms of what the framers thought or even what previous Supreme Court justices thought um, years and years and years and years ago. So um, that's the camp that I'm in, but I understand there are other camps and those legal reasonings and their philosophies are also valid. So that's our job to be sort of involved in politics and, um, and try to make sure that our court, um, our executive, our just judicial and our legislative branch is, uh, reflect the nation as a whole. Um, so with all of that, what, can you say this tells us about the decisions that we might expect on future cases? 
Well, it tells us that if you were like me when I was in law school or in high school, thinking that once you had a right that was decreed by the Supreme Court, that it was almost guaranteed that you would keep it. If you would have told me that Roe v. Casey would have been overruled 10 years ago, I would have said, no, that is a right. Supreme Court said we have this right. We have stare decisis. We have this issue, this like sacrosanct um, belief that that what has been held is going to be relied upon in the future. And absent some major chain of thought, absent some something new to make us think that we should change it, then it should be the same, right? But things haven't changed so much and, and with, with regard to um, people's uh, thinking about abortion rights. Um, there, there are different camps, but right now the majority of the country believes a woman has a right to, to choose. Now, there are um, limits to that. People have different ideas about what that should look like, but those are things that could be can be walked out. We can discuss, and, and of course, right now, that would be to the states um, to, to decide. Um, but if you thought that you could rely on the Supreme Court to give us this guidance, this framework that we can rely on for years and years and years and years down the line, at, at this point, um, we, don't, we don't really have that guidance. Um, another thing you can expect is for uh, legal scholars to really be thinking about what we call this penumbra of rights. And a penumbra of rights is usually interpreted to be rights that aren't explicitly detailed in the Constitution, but that we can infer from the Constitution. And privacy is one of those things. Now, we all carry uh, tracking devices everywhere we go. Our, where our geolocations are tagged, we're posting on Facebook. We're, well, I used to post on Facebook, but the young kids, I guess they're doing TikTok, they're, they're doing these, uh, the more modern modes of social media. Um, but we're, now we're trying to really to, to determine what are our privacy rights? And the Supreme Court has said to us, what you thought you had with regard to privacy, we may not have that. So other rights that have been determined, um, rights to, to marriage, um, gender equality, um, rights to, um, uh, to marry who you love with regard to race. These are things that we thought were settled. And right now with the court that we have on, on that are sitting, those rights may not be settled. They, they may be up for grabs. So that's what I would say about what that decision means for the future. So the last question I have, and, and you know, I think about our students and, and many of our students are probably pretty upset with, with this decision and what can be expected about future decisions. Do we as citizens or do our students have any kind of recourse uh, going forward? I always say you have to think about the things you can change, right? The Supreme Court, they are appointed for life. So barring some sort of um, impeachment proceedings, which is highly unlikely, given the the work, the given the constituents who are uh, that are in the Senate, it's not going to happen. I can't see it happening. But you know, stranger things <laughs> have happened in the last eight years. Um, but there's this thing that says politics is local. So you want to start where you are. Who are these grassroots these grassroots organizations? What are they doing? How are they meeting? Are they um, having good relationships with their constituents? So if you're in Delaware, if you're in, Pens in Pennsylvania right now, it's a great place to be active if you feel um, your rights may be in danger. Um, that you know there's there's things that you can do in the local level. Um, can you appoint a Supreme Court justice? No, but if you're 21 years old and you are reading right now and becoming very active, maybe you will run for office one day. Maybe you will be part of a nonprofit. Um, so I know that sometimes when, when, when I was younger, I didn't really get involved in politics until there was a you know, presidential election because that's what, is what you saw. But there are school board elections that are not really announced. Get out there, know who, I mean, for kids that maybe you're not so, <laughs> so uh, maybe that's not a pressing concern for you, but as a parent where you live, the school board is very important. Um, look, who is your attorney general? Look, look, to, look to Delaware's website, see what they are thinking. Um, there are, uh, um, even in the, our lower courts, in the Court of Common Pleas, in our Superior Court, in the Supreme Court, there are vacancies. You can see, how are these judges ruling? Where is my state going? And so you have to start where you are. If you're interested, become local and grassroots organizations um, and think to yourself. Um, maybe you don't see yourself as a politician, but if we are going to see change, you're going to have to be the change. So I want to see these younger people you know, running for office. I want to see um, people who thought they could not be a part of the political landscape seeing themselves there and understand that they can make a change. 
Thank you so much. Um, are there any questions I haven't asked you that you think I should have? I think your questions are pretty comprehensive, but I feel like there's so many questions all of us have. Like, where does this leave us now? The country is so divided. Um, in a way that I don't think we have been able to see in such stark relief, right? I feel like um, the two administrations we have had have been two sides of a coin and where does that leave us civically? And it leads us to really um, have conversations with our neighbors, have conversations with people outside of your thought process. Um, we need to be understanding each other in an effort to come together. So while there may be this instinct to run to your tribe, to run to your corner, to call with people who think like you, there should always be room to talk with and engage with people who do not think like you. And maybe not in an effort to convince them complete completely, but an effort to understand everyone's humanity. If we can see everyone's humanity, then maybe we can see hope towards the future to bring us together. Ms. Kanisha Ringel, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate you, you talking to us today. Thank you. You have a good one.